It's nice to see the body of Christ welcome each other as we do. This would be a good day to start a new sermon series on Hades, but we're not going to do that. <laughs> Let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. You alone, O oh Lord, provide a way for us in this sometimes dark and stormy world. Illuminate your word in our hearts by your Holy Spirit and bless our understanding of your word this day. Amen. First reading is from the book of Malachi, the last of the 12 Old Testament minor prophets. Now God has instructed Malachi to expose Israel's corruption, yet offer them a word of hope. Malachi has the final Old Testament word to Israel, and now what follows is known as the 40, 400 years of silence. And Malachi's message is prepare the way for the one who is the way. So reading from Malachi chapter 2. You have wearied the Lord with your words, but you say, how have we wearied him? By saying, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he who delights in them. Or by asking, where is the God of justice? Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Now Malachi prophesies of the coming of the way of the Lord, and that is Jesus, because he is the way. Now as you can, please join with me in reading the gospel as shown on your screen. Here's the gospel of John, chapter 14. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where, where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. In Colossians, the Apostle Paul warns believers about people who make up new roles and ways for Christians to live to promote their false gospel, a gospel without Jesus Christ as Lord and Head. So reading from Colossians 2, verses 16 through 23, Paul writes, Therefore, let no one judge you because of what you eat or drink or about the observances of any annual holy days, new moons, festivals, or weekly days of rest, holy days. These are a shadow of things to come, but the body that casts the shadow belongs to Christ. Let no one who delights in false humility and worship of angels tell you that you don't deserve a prize. Such a person whose sinful mind fills him with arrogance gives endless details of the visions he has seen. He does not hold on to Christ, the head. Christ makes the whole body grow as God wants it to, through support and unity given by the joints and ligaments. If you have died with Christ to the world's ways of doing things, why do you let others tell you how to live? It is as though you are still under the world's influence. People will tell you, don't handle this, don't taste that, don't touch that. All these ways deal with objects that are only used up anyways. These things look like wisdom in their self-imposed worship, false humility, and harsh treatment of the body. But they have no value for holding back the constant desires of your corrupt nature. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Direction. Men hate to ask for it, but there is a direction. It's defined as a course or path along which someone or something takes. When you go on a journey, it's important to be traveling in the right direction. Being on the proper path is important. Moving in the right direction is key. But the question is, how can we obtain the proper direction for our earthly travel? A compass. We use a compass to direct our travel and it shows us the way to go. Finding direction here on earth, it's based on a true north reference. We rely on a compass to direct us on our proper destination. 
A compass is a full circle and contains 360 degrees, and we use that to navigate. If we look at the compass, one degree seems so small, so minute, so small part of the compass. But when we're using a compass to navigate your travel, being off by just one degree will lead you in a direction and will lead you off course. Now, being off course one degree at a distance of one foot, you'll miss your mark by two-tenths of an inch. That's not too bad. Now, football fans, now considering one of the best Super Bowl passes of all time, Terry Bradshaw's fourth quarter pass to Lynn Swan in Super Bowl X against the Cowboys, if Bradshaw would have missed by one degree, he would have missed Lynn Swan by over three feet, and in the Steelers' chances with an incomplete pass versus a Super Bowl championship winning throw. Launching a rocket to the moon, if you're off by just one degree, the spacecraft will miss the moon by a mere 4,169 miles. Let's go the opposite direction. What happens if you're a neurosurgeon and you're operating on someone's brain and you miss where you're supposed to operate by just a small amount? You see, sometimes being slightly off course, although unnoticeable, can be tragic. The misdirection can take you somewhere you never planned on going. Now, there was an Air New Zealand flight, TE-901, a sightseeing flight that takes place where they would go and look at the beauty of the Antarctic. Air New Zealand was successfully flying this popular sightseeing route for over two years. And on November 28, 1979, 500 and 257 people departed New Zealand on that sightseeing flight. The pilots approached what they thought was their intended destination. What happened? numerous times over the past two years. Pilots began their descent to a lower altitude so the sightseers could look out the windows and see the beauty of the frozen landscape. Although the pilots had years of experience, they've never been on this particular flight path before. They followed the flight, flight plan. They followed their instruments. Unknown to the pilots, there was a two-degree error in the flight coordinates. And most people thinking, that's close enough. But two degrees error put the aircraft 28 miles off course of their planned route. So they had no way of knowing that they had incorrect coordinates and that placed them in the direct path of Mount Erebus, an active volcano that rose above the frozen landscape to a height of 12,000 feet. The pilots thought they were on the right path. And sadly, the plane crashed into the side of the volcano and there was no survivors. You see, being off course, even by one degree, that will lead you off course. And that's what Paul warns the believers, to beware of those imposing self-serving self additional rules that, that look good and watch out for false teachers. Especially beware of those who've lost their relationship, their connection with the head the of, the, of the church, of the body of Christ, and that is Jesus Christ. This is the error of the Colossians, that they had a defective view of Christ. Their religion was flawed. Their disconnection from the relationship with Jesus Christ was real. They were off course, and what can appear as the right path instead leads you astray, and that's what Paul warns. And he makes two clear warnings. Number one, it's dangerous for a person or a church not to be in relationship with Jesus Christ and recognize him alone as the head, as the leader. And secondly, it's dangerous when people impose new religious roles or requirements onto believers. There are warning signs when it appears believers practice false humility, self-serving worship, special revelation because their doctrine is their doctrine and they're the only ones who understand it. So number one, danger number one, not holding on to Christ the head. Now a healthy church abides in Jesus, sees Jesus alone as the head of the church, her leader and her Lord. Because in Christ the whole body grows as God wants through support and unity. 
Now the flip side, the opposite approach is not allowing Jesus to be Lord over the church or your life. Now people place themselves or another person as the head of the church, and when they do that, they deny Christ his rightful place as Lord and head. Instead of growth, the church self-destructs, lacks unity, and dies. Likewise, if Christ is not the head of our life, we can suffer the same ultimate consequences. Because it is right, it is just, for Jesus to be the head of the church, to lead the church, for he is the author and finisher of our faith. He is our Lord and Savior and Redeemer, and he gives us life. He is all-knowing and all-powerful. He is perfect and pure. He is our good shepherd, and he alone should direct us. Now, anyone or anything other than Jesus that claims authority over the body of Christ denies God. And following anyone or anything other than Jesus is to ignore, avoid, disobey the instructions of the head himself, and that is Christ. And the church becomes a truly dysfunctional, ugly, two-headed monster. When disconnected from the head as we believers, we, the church can be hindered. And we lack the fullness of God's will and the purpose of God is not fulfilled. We miss the mark. A church with two heads is off course. The church belongs to Christ. And her leadership is not abdicated to a finite man or woman. It's not human's position to reign over, redesign, redirect the church in any form, in any teaching, in any leadership. Let me repeat that. It's not human's position to reign over, redesign, or redirect the church in form, teaching, or ultimate leadership. You see, where a human is exalted to claim to be the head of the church, by the way, that is a lie. There is no such thing. They are not the head. They are instead an antagonist against the church, and they are opposed to God. And if and when this happens, the Spirit of the Lord, maybe the glory of the Lord, as in the Old Testament say, would depart from that church. Paul says, don't be deceived. We are not to be deceived. Jesus will not share the headship of the church with anyone or anything. Our God is a jealous God and a righteous God, and he will not and cannot share his glory. To mess with the hierarchy of Jesus as the head is simply put dangerous. A pastor, elders, a dysfunctional session, self-proclaimed leaders, anyone or anything that sits on the throne to complete the head of the church, well, that's perilous, and by no other means are trying to tempt a God who's not temptable. Beware of any human who attempts to sit on the throne in place of God, because it looks a lot like Satan's rebellion, doesn't it? This is truly, truly dangerous. For you see, the body of Christ is alive, and her head is alive and living. The church is everlasting, and her head is eternal, all-knowing, all-powerful. Her head is Christ alone. Now, for our session and the elders of this church, we affirm, we confess, we proclaim that the leadership of MLEPC, the leadership of the EPC and the leaders of the church university, universal, the leadership is solely Christ. Now, the goal and mission of session is to discern the mind of Christ, but not to be Christ. As session, we humbly present ourselves to the head in obedience, knowing we're not the head. Now, how do we stay attached to Jesus as the head? We do that through prayer, through worship, through study of Scripture, through gathering together in fellowship, through obedience with humility, and through accountability. Now, in Christ alone, the church is held together, and it grows because God is the one who grows it. Now, we as the body of Christ, we are to be obedient to Christ's leadership and authority. Jesus lived for the church. Jesus died for his church. Jesus rose from the dead for his church, and Jesus is alive today, ruling and reigning over his church. 
Now the second danger Paul warns about is holding on to practices or, or false worship or deceptive ideas or theologies. He warns that there are such things as false practices and theologies rooted and based in sinful human minds, rooted in arrogance, false humility, and bad theology. He warns us as false teachers, they may appear to be great in their modesty and humility as they preach a message of power and goodness, yet they turn away from the gospel. Their mind is carnal. They are puffed up by a sense of superiority, of knowledge, of self-proclaimed holiness. But they're off course. Although they have the appearance of a spiritual discipline, Paul warns, they assume it is because of their work, not the finished work of Christ, that they can approach the throne of God in their own goodness, in their own righteousness. They live in a world expecting salvation because of their human performance. What they practice and promote instead is a flawed religious philosophy and practice, which looks like wisdom, but instead is untruths and deceptions. It's a false humility. It is not wisdom at all. To them, Jesus is not enough. It's Jesus plus something. It's the worship of Jesus plus angels. It's observing man-made ways to holiness. But these things have no value if you're truly in Christ. There are handwritten religious rules and ordinances claiming to make us more holy and more worthy. But understand, all man-made religious rules are nailed to the cross. This is the bitter root of a religious cult, their lies, their deceit, their self-righteousness. Paul warns us, don't be deceived. Being off course just by one degree is the beginning of a lie. And Paul warns us, don't be deceived. Don't let anybody take that prize, the crown from which you have obtained your eternal glory and victory in Christ alone. There's only one way to approach the throne. That is through Jesus Christ, who is the truth, the life, and the way. And let it be a curse to anyone who proclaims there are many ways to God and that Christ is only one way and not the only way. We approach God, we come, we completely needy, needy. We lay hold of Christ alone. It's not Christ plus work. It's not Christ plus religious actions, it's not Christ plus some secret revelation from the angels. Christ is our prize, don't let somebody take it. But however in our lives, in our walk with Christ, we can lose our direction, we can get blown off course by the storms of life we face. Sickness, finances, loss of a job, death of a loved one, an overwhelming or stress-filled life, we can find ourselves in unfamiliar territory because we're prone to wonder. Yet God wants to guide us. He wants to guide us because he loves us. When we go astray and leave God's path, he wants to restore our way to his way. God wants to redirect us back on course, to give us a course correction, shall I say, to refocus, to recommit, and to be refreshed. Now at Walt Disney World, there's a simply magical place called Tomorrowland Speedway. This allows you to speed around the winding track in the Magic Kingdom. And for a short period of time, anyone who's over 54 inches tall can sit in a gas-powered go-kart type car, fasten their seatbelt, and enjoy a good old-fashioned fun drive. The goal is to drive around the track using the steering wheel and gas and brake to negotiate the track. The goal was to keep the car centered and enjoy the view. Now, if you look closely at the picture, you can see there is a guide rail in the center that keeps the car in its own lane. So I don't get too far off course. And just in case there's a shock absorbing bumper, just in case you violate the person in front of you's space. Now, here's an example a personal example of the joy and challenges of staying on course. (laughs) 
Well, the truth of the matter, that is my daughter Hannah, at 12 years old, successfully negotiating the course at the, Wonderland, the uh, Speedway. It was successful because we got back to where we're supposed to go. What's missing, what you can't hear in one of the videos, is she is very much an all-hands type person and wanted to inform me, keep all your hands and feet and camera inside the car, mister, <laughs> as she's driving. And you can see there's joy in Hannah's face as she's maneuvering in the car, and it's bouncing back and forth, sometimes a bit shocking, by the guide, guide rail. But the guide rail did what it's supposed to do. It keeps us moving forward. If we strayed off course, if Hannah strayed off course, the guide rail redirected the car. And you can see, even with the banging of the car back and forth, the center guide rail was there. And you stay moving in the right direction. And when you get off course, that guide rail directs the guide rail corrects your course. And yes, even regardless of the steering wheel input to some part of the driver, the car remains generally pointed in the right direction. When you get off course, you may bang off that center guardrail. That's my grunting and groaning in the video. But your course has been corrected. You continue in the right direction. And for me, Jesus is my guide rail. Through his word, prayer, study, worship, fellowship, he keeps me going in the right direction. Even if I stray off course, one degree or maybe more, he's my guide rail because he is the way, the truth, and the life. He is my guide rail. And when I think I'm doing such a great job, all of a sudden, bang, I hit that center rail hard. I hit that guide rail and God leads me back to the center and redirects my course. Now sometimes it's a gentle redirection and sometimes it's that banging back and forth till I get it. The steering wheel jolts and the car bounces around a little bit. Sometimes I hit the brakes to stop and refocus, and get my bearings and set the course to straight and narrow again. But life is hard. It's full of course corrections and God corrects our course because he loves us. And if you ask God and allow God to guide you and direct you, guess what? He will. Without the guide rail to keep you focused, to keep you on course, without Christ in our lives, where are you going? Who or what is giving you direction? How is your life course being set? Without that guide rail in our lives, where would we end up? Because I don't want to end up in Never Never Land. Be Christ, in Christ, there is a promised course truly to our eternally happily ever after. In life, we're able to be like what the brochure in the Tomorrowland Speedway says, strap in and enjoy the view. Keep moving forward. Allow God to direct you and guide you. When you bang off that guide rail, when you think you're going on the right direction and God corrects your course, stop. Look around. And see what God is doing in your life and thank Him for keeping you in the right direction and keeping you on course. The world offers us many different courses to traverse, but in the all truth of truths, there's only one way in this life and the next. There's only one truth. There's only one true north for our compass. And he is the way to God, the only way. And his name is Jesus. The teachings and actions of false teachers and false religions may sound and look familiar. They may actually sound enticing, but if they are off by at least one degree, it's the beginning of a lie. Being off biblical truth, even by one degree, can be the beginning of a lie. And that lie is not going to take us in the right direction or to the right destination. Check your course. 
Ask God to correct your course and path as needed. Focus on Christ. This is true for us personally, and this is true for us as the body of Christ. Off course. God will correct your path and direct you. The guide rail is there. Pray that you are led and comforted by the Master's hand. If you're frightened and afraid, if you've made poor choices, God loves you and he wants a relationship with you through Jesus Christ. If you think you're off course, stop. Lift up your face to heaven, open your heart and pray to God to forgive you and lead you and redirect your life. No one is beyond God's love. No one is beyond God's rescue. No one is beyond God's course correction. Because Jesus is our way maker. He will instruct and guide us along the paths and watch our progress. He tells us to listen for his voice from behind. Say, no, you're off course. Go this way. We need to trust in God and not ourselves, for he knows the plans he has for us, for good and not for evil. Scripture tells us again and again, he is our way maker. He cares for us. If you feel your Christian walk is off just a kilter, maybe one degree, maybe more, ask God to redirect you. For those without Jesus, Know that he is the truth of life and the way, and he will direct you in the way to go. For without Jesus, there is no guide rail. There is no true direction. There is no true north to your compass. And without direction, we are prone to wonder. Now may Jesus direct our lives. May Jesus form our lives. May Jesus shape our character. And may Jesus stir in us truth and hope to persevere and stay on course. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you are our true north. In our personal walk with you and as the body of Christ, please be our guide and direct our lives. Lord, in your tender mercy, provide guidance and direction as the head of MLEPC, and guard and guide and direct session in the elders and leaders of MLEPC, the EPC, and the Church Universal. Lord, warn us and protect us against the dangers of false teaching and all the things that can lead us astray. Guard your church against dangerous behaviors and false leaders. May we always hold fast to your truth. Holy God, give us a sensitive spirit and guide us by your Holy Spirit. Be patient with us, O God. Keep directing us even when we bang off that center guide rail. May your course corrections bring us joy and assurance that you are still with us. Dear sweet Lord, you are faithful. You carry us through hard times in life and rescue us when we're off course. We rest eternally in your promise to never leave us or forsake us. And in all things and all times, be our Lord, be our head, and be our blessed guide. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand together as we confess our faith as the body of Christ, using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, 
born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He ascended into hell. Third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the resurrection of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.